Now that shit got you pumped up. Come on, church. Now getting ready, getting ready to worship. That anticipation, that excitement. Well, good morning, TCIP. Here we go. Thank you, Lord, for the rain. It's a beautiful spring day outside. Amen, amen. All right, first things are first. Stay connected to your church. Get the church app. Just go to your app store or Google Play, download it. That's where the text and all the upcoming events will be. So just get on that church app. You can tithe on it, uh, especially like when VBS and all that starts coming about. We can tie into that and get everybody kind of signed up and try to, you know, uh, modernize this place a little bit. Also, yeah, just a little bit. All right. Gra uh, graduating seniors, college or high school. If you're graduating this year, you need to see my wife, Karen. We're going to set up the table like last year and maybe get you a few dollars here and there or some blessings or something. This is my wife right here. Stand up, please, my dear. Come see my wife and we'll get you all signed up because we're going to need pictures, right? Some things like that. So if you got a graduating senior, college or high school, no, you're not. No, 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 no. <laughs> you're a you're definitely senior. Graduated. See, she made me say graduate. Because she said, if I just say senior, that's all of us. You know, like we're going to get some money. All right, this Tuesday, if you're available, this Tuesday, this is very important. We, Casey and Kelly, and we went, I guess, in February. We've been invited back to go to the Fellowship of Student, Christian Students, Fellowship of Christian Students. It used to be athletes, now they changed it to students. We get to minister to the seventh and eighth grade. That's about 260 kids. We're going to take them pizza. We need some people to serve and just be there with some joy to pray for these kids as we just kind of gather together. Kelly's going to be playing. We're going to have a blast, guys. I promise you we're going to have fun over there talking to these uh, uh, junior high students. So this Tuesday, if you want to go to see me, we're going to, it starts from 11 to 1. We'll get the 7th grade in one group, and then we'll get the 8th grade in one group. All right, also, May 21st is another Tuesday if you're available. Again, this is something we've done three years with the, with the graduating Peaster Seniors, the brunch that we have. So we're going to put on the brunch again. We're going to have them on Archway with the 2024 graduates. We put them a big spread. They come over here. They, they go to all the classes that day and say goodbye to everyone. Then they come here and we have a brunch for them. We have music playing and we just want to congratulate them. And guys, this is part of, as, as a church, as a community here, we want them to see your face. That we're a nice and friendly people. This is not a scary place to come over. They can come over and, I mean, we put on the spread, right, Casey? They got fruit, eggs, everything. I mean, it's an awesome time. It's our third year to do it, and we're glad to do it for them this year, too. Uh, also, May 22nd will, will be our last Wednesday night. We'll take our summer break. So May 22nd will be the last Wednesday night, and that's when school's out, and we'll kick it back off in uh, probably late August or September. May the 5th. Men's meeting, May the 5th. Come and hang out with us at 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock over in the student building. Come and hang out. I know the women's ministries are going. Also, camp is coming up. Junior high and high school. Start getting ready for camp. That's going to be July the 7th through the 11th. We're going to Waco. It's an awesome. We've been to this camp. This is Wild Week. So if you've got a junior high or a high schooler that wants to go to camp, again, you may not can afford it, we'll, we will find sponsors for you. If you've got a child that's ready to go, we want them to go. Amen? All right. That's a lot of announcements, right? You guys ready? Well, let's stand up and let's get ready to worship God. You know, this morning it was just in the book of James says, you have not because you ask not. Let's come asking God to do a miracle amongst us. Amen? Do something fantastic. Hope you're here today with an expectant heart. Don't just come to church. I, I went to church. I went to spend time with God. And that's what we're coming in here for. Amen? All right. Good morning. Today's reading is from Galatians 6, verses 7 through 10. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you today with just 
grateful, excited hearts. God, thank you for this place. Thank you for filling this place, dear Lord. Thank you for being here with us. God, thank you for these miracles you send, big and small, every single day. God, just remind us that it is impossible to not believe in you if we don't open up our eyes and just look around at all the miracles you give us every day, dear Lord. God, thank you for these clouds you send and the rain you send and the green fields we have, God. We drive down the road and we're surrounded by your miracles, the wildflowers on the side of the road, the mountains you've created, the birds that fly around and sing in your name, dear Lord. Just every day, God, I pray with you with a grateful heart, an excited heart, dear Lord, for the miracles you send us every single day, the small ones and the big ones, God. Thank you for this place. Thank you for being in this place, dear Lord. Please bless this day. Bless this group as we, we come and we just sing your name. Pray in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Awesome. All right. You know the rules. Now, Jesus said, they'll know you are mine by the way you love each other. Go tell somebody you love them. Go say hello. Go give somebody a hug. Somebody needs it. Come on.
sorrow and deaden my sin Lost without hope, no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested in my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your endless love Pouring down on us You have made me new Now life Change, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began. Washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in man That's when death was arrested so free washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your best love Us new now life begins with you. Sing it with me, church. Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the king. Yes, we're free, free, forever, amen. When death was arrested in my life began. Oh, we're free. Forever we're free Come join the song of all the redeemed Yes, we're free, free Forever, amen 
When death was arrested and my life began When death was arrested and my life began When death was arrested and my life began church let us pray Lord Jesus we know that we can never match through our tithes our gifts and offerings the price you paid for our salvation we acknowledge that it is not the amount we bring but rather our attitude in giving may our gifts today be received by our joy gratitude and thanksgiving in the name of Jesus the Messiah we pray amen Trials 
of famine and darkness and sword. Still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shouting like the sun, at the trumpet call, and lift your voice, year of jubilee, now to Zion till salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel The drop bones becoming flesh And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding a temple of praise And these are the days of the harvest The fields are as wide in the world and we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, and lift your voice, year of jubilee, now to Zion till salvation comes. God like Jehovah, there's no 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 God like Jehovah. 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 Holy oh, God, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, and lift your voice, year of jubilee. I have one thing to say to you, Maranatha. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. You know, we started what I did not know would end up being, a, it's a, in my heart anyway, it's a very serious series, and I've just taken it into account how valuable, how valuable it has been to my own life on this series, which will continue this morning. Let's just rehash for just a moment what our series is all about. And um, I, have, I have entitled today's message, Faith Now. Faith Now. Now, now the first thing we have, when everybody hears faith, especially in spiritual terms, we hear it in the, in the, with the understanding of our own background. Some people say, just have faith. Well, faith in what? See, ours is not a faith in what, it's a faith in who? It's a faith in Jesus. So years ago, I get, came up with my own definition of faith, and this is what it is. My appropriate action to what God has spoken. That's simple enough. That's faith. My appropriate action to what God has spoken. That's faith. Keep that in the back of your minds, and I hope that you're taking notes this morning. This won't take real long today because we are in a series, and I don't have to get in a hurry because I can just preach what I leave off next week. So, and anyway, let's get on with it. There are, that, that we have identified anyway, at least, at least seven um, 
sermons that are being preached by the world. Now, we're going to get real specific. Now, I saw something this morning in my office before I came to church, and I got as interested in that as I was in, what, in, in the notes that I have in front of me. Because what, what I've been calling sermon, the scriptures called testimony. Now, we're going to get into this in great detail next Sunday morning because I haven't even looked at it except for this morning for about an hour. What I call sermon is actually what the scriptures call a testimony. So I'm going to start using the word testimony instead of sermon, which I'll show you next week where I get all this. And I think you'll be as fascinated as I was this morning. So there are seven testimonies that are going on in the world today. Three or four of them are very good. The first way that we, and I'm just going to rehash this in about five minutes, then we'll move on. The first testimony is the testimony of a man preaching, what you see right now. But what you see is still a flawed individual who has his own problems and cares and sickness and getting old and just, just life happens. And with nine grandkids, it really happens. So the way that, the way that you hear me, as, as perfect as I want it to be and as right as I want it to be, and as pleasing to Jesus as I want to be, it will still never come to 100% fruition. In other words, you're, you're seeing a man who has brought, been brought out of a fall and who has baggage. All of, every preacher, if a preacher stands up and tells you he's not that way, go somewhere else because we are flawed individuals. But what an honor, what an honor to be given by God the gift of preaching. It's, it's such an honor that sometimes my breath is taken away from me. I can't believe where God has placed me in my life and in, in this life on this, this one time, this one shot on this earth. And God has allowed me over the past 40 years to pastor what I think is an incredibly loving and good and powerful church, the church in Peaster. But it's still flawed, and the church is still flawed, and the membership of the church, the members of the body of Christ are still flawed individuals. And so we get the charge of hypocrisy cast against us. It's a legitimate, it's a legitimate charge because we have, we, they have the idea that we don't, we're, we're perfect or better than everybody. No, we need, just need to admit that we are flawed individuals, but our Christ is perfect. So when you hear a man testify, and nearly said preach again, when you hear a man testify, it's still limited. It's still, it's still shady in that it, it cut, it's not fully exposed. I could, never, I could never preach the truths to its fullness, first of all, because our information is even limited. But even if I understood every word in this book, which I don't, but if I understood it all, it wouldn't matter. It's not enough information to preach or to witness to the fullness of who God is. The only real thing that we know about God the Father, you know, the first thing that we know, God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't tell us how. It doesn't tell us when. It doesn't tell us anything except for his pleasure he created these things. He just did it because he's God. So no matter how much I know or I think I know, it will always come up to be subpar to what God or who God is. I can never, I can never testify about him to its fullness. So that's flawed testimony. The second testimony is when Jesus testified. You will find man testifying, is, testimony is flawed. But what you will always find is that the Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, his preaching was always perfect. Perfect every time. Then we move on to the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit testifies, you will find power in your life. When all of a sudden everything that you touch begins to turn to spiritual gold and you're hearing things in your head that are right and, and you're giving a discerning spirit for that, for that brief moment of time to discern a problem or somebody's having a problem, you discern that. There is, when, when the Holy Spirit testifies in the church, there is power and there is healing. And it's, it's always, it's, it's an incredible thing. And then when the Father testifies, so we've looked at when man testifies, when Jesus testifies, when, when the Holy Spirit testifies, and, and when the Father testifies, he testifies through creation. It's a, it's a lot like Alex talked about this morning in his prayer. Thank you for creation. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for the greenery of everything. And that birds still sing. See, God creates through creation, or he, he testifies through creation. But what about us? What do we need to know about faith? What is this faith that, because I, I can't think of a greater time, at least in my life, when, 
when faith is under attack by the other forces that are testifying, and they are the three forces. We have four on that, that are very positive. When man preaches, testifies. When Jesus testifies, when the Holy Spirit testifies, and when the God the Father testifies. But the other three, there's three more testimonies that, that are just bedazzle us. They just hit us from every side, and that's the, the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so I just jot down three things. When the world, when the world testifies, it's in darkness. And you would all agree that the world is now in darkness. You would also agree with me that in the flesh, the testimony is all about me. Ego, my mind, my will, my emotions, my wants, my desires, the way that I see things, my perspective, selfishness, greed, bigotry, all those other things that are. So when, when the flesh testifies, it's all about me. And when the devil testifies, it's always evil. So when man testifies, it's flawed. When Jesus testifies, it's perfect. When the Holy Spirit testifies, it's powerful. When the Father testifies, it's creational. When the world testifies, it's in darkness, always darkness. When the flesh testifies, it's always about me. It's about ego. And when the devil testifies, it's always about evil. Now let's look, please, at Romans 1, verses 16 and 17 before we get started this morning. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For it is in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, that appropriate action of what God has spoken from appropriate action of what God has spoken. As it is written, but the righteous man and woman shall live by the appropriate action which God has spoken. That's the way we are to live. I want you to turn, please, to John chapter 11, an, an extremely familiar, uh, I hope it's familiar to you, I'm sure it will be, if you've spent any time or years in church, you're, you're going to know this story, and I'm counting on that. I'm counting on you to know enough of this story to be able to see the truths, because today we're going to talk about faith and how it can fail. The first thing we need to establish before we read uh, John chapter 11, the first thing we need to establish is the love that Jesus had for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We know quite a bit about their relationship. We know, for instance, that they lived in Bethany, which is about two miles outside the, still there today. You can go about two miles to the east of the eastern gate, and there it is, a little, a little village called Bethany. We know that they were from there. We know that they had probably had quite a bit of money, that they were not poor people at all. We also know that they had not forsaken the, their own synagogue, that they were still in, in good standing with their synagogue. We know that they, whenever Jesus would come into Jerusalem from Galilee, that they would let him stay with them, and that Jesus enjoyed that a lot. We, we know that Jesus loved them as he loved his own family, and we know that they loved him to equal proportions. So we have this incredible, loving Jesus attitude going into this story. And I think that most people within the sound of my voice this morning, I think you love Jesus. I think you have a relationship with him. It may differ from mine or from the person sitting next to you, but you have some form of a relationship with Christ or you wouldn't be sitting here today hungering for the word. I hunger for the word today. I do. I just preach to myself and I'm excited how my own spirit responds to what I'm about to testify about. So they had faith. There's no doubt in my mind. They were with Jesus sometimes when he would heal the sick, and when he would uh, heal the blind, or forgive prostitutes, or hug lepers and forgive them and heal them of their infirmities. They were in kind of this inner circle of personal friends of Jesus who loved him and knew him well. Knew him so well that, I mean, you're going to get tickled here in about two minutes by something that's said about this relationship that maybe you've never seen before. So let's see how faith can fail even though you're in a relationship with Jesus. I'm not talking to non-believers this morning. We're talking to believers of Jesus as the Messiah today. Beginning reading in verse 11, chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary, the same Mary, who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, the one whom you love is sick. 
verse 3 kind of tickles me. It, it, but in a, in a very serious way, I'm, it, makes me, it makes me smile. Because at this time, look, I'm, let's read verse 3. Maybe you've never seen it. I really had never thought much about it. But look at verse 3. <clears throat> the sisters sent word to Jesus saying, Lord, behold, whom you love is sick. He wasn't there. Just to show you how solid and good and wonderful and close this relationship was, do you notice that they didn't turn to each other here in verse 3 and say, I wonder where he is. You, want, you talk about reality. You see, where he was at this time was in a province called Perea. You have Galilee to the north, Judea to the south, and Perea to the east of the Jordan River. He was in Perea. We know that from the timelines of his preaching in Perea. It's called the Perean ministry. There it is. We know that he was in Perea. But they knew where to send the messenger to go and find Jesus. You talk about, think of, no satellites, Casey, no phones, no computers, no internet, no social media, nothing, word of mouth. How in the world would they have known where he was had he not left them his itinerary? And we have an itinerary of Jesus. We know where he's supposed to be, where we will find him, where we can call on his name at any time. He has given his, his children and his brothers and sisters in Christ, he has given us his itinerary. That where, when we're in trouble, we know where to find Jesus. And the same thing happened here that day. They, well, maybe he's in Galilee. Maybe he's in Tyre or Sidon. Maybe he's down in Egypt right now. Maybe he's in Syria. They said, no, he, he's in Perea. You go, and they, and they told him exactly where the, this had to have. Read it again. Look at verse 3. So the sisters sent word to him. How'd they know where to send him? Itinerary. Saying, Lord, behold, the one whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved, here we go again with this love, this relationship thing. There's nothing wrong here. Their brother has died. They're hurting. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and he loved Lazarus. So when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. They even knew the house to send this messenger to and to this place where he was. Then after this, he said to them, to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to Jesus, Rabbi, now remember, Judea is that where Jerusalem is. It's, in the, it's like a county. In the middle of that is Jerusalem. And they hate Jesus. The Galileans, <coughs> excuse me, the Galileans love Jesus. The Judeans hate him. And the Pereans are not too sure about anything. The disciples said to him, verse 8, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. The last time he was there, they tried to kill him, tried to assassinate him. And are you going there again? Verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. This he said, and, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of his sleep. The disciples then said to him, Jesus, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of a literal sleep. So Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Here comes Thomas, doubting Thomas, remember him. Therefore Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciple, All right, okay, let us go, and then we'll die with him there. He just, I can't believe we're going back into the seat of hatred towards us. Let's just all go back, and we're all going to die. But let's all go with you, but let's all die in the process. Little being a little bit overdramatic as Thomas had that tendency. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already, that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. In Jewish theology, four days is when the spirit departs the body. The spirit hovers in Jewish tradition. And this is not maybe factual, but this is what the Jew funeral service required. That they believed that the, the, the spirit hung around for three days and then on the fourth day it went to be with God and the Father in heaven. 
So that was proof that you were dead after the third day. The spirit was, according to Jewish tradition, if you read it in the Talmud, I wouldn't, but if you did, it even says that the one thing that all d dead Jews are allowed to do is hear their own funeral service. They get to sit in. So some synagogues would even bring in a chair so that the spirit could sit in the chair. What kind of spirit needs a chair to sit in? You ain't got no body. You ain't got no butt. But anyway, that's Jewish theology. So he's been dead four days. He definitely dead. No swooning. No fake. No conspiracy. He's dead. Verse 17, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Verse 18, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. So they've come from Perea to the very gates of Jerusalem itself in a little village just outside that gate called Bethany. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Verse 19, and, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, now there, here we go, stay with me on this. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet Jesus, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha, what now, friends, loves Jesus, believes he is the Messiah, have witnessed and heard his words on these sermons. They've heard he is a celebrity. They're friends with a celebrity. Intimate, intimately intimate relationship with him. He stays at their home. They believe that he is the Messiah. <clears throat> they have money, prestige, and power. The funeral proves that. They weren't kicked out of their synagogue for being followers of Jesus. They were smart enough to have him as their best friend and still get by with sharing Jesus as the Messiah in their synagogue. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a funeral like this. I just want you to understand, and I hope I'm conveying to you the seriousness and the depth of this relationship. Because that's going to come in real powerful to us in about 30 seconds. Because I don't care how strong your relationship with Christ is. I don't care how much you love him. I don't care how much you think you know him or how much you do actually know him. And how much you pray and how much you give in your offering and how much you, you come to church and you understand and you love your church and you love people in that church and you express that love and people see Jesus on you and you'll share Jesus with somebody so fast if you're in a Walmart or a grocery store or a convenience store, school, work, you're the first to defend Jesus and to proclaim him as the Messiah. Even people like that can fail in their faith. Now watch how, watch how she responds to Jesus showing up four days late. Watch how you, because it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty incredible. Watch. Verse 21, Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, that means kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S, kurios, you're the highest, here we go again with this relationship, you are the highest authority in my life. Curios, not Lord as in Lord over things. You are, kurios, you are the highest authority in my life. That's a good relationship. I hope you're getting that. I, I'm sure am. Martha said to Jesus, kurios, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Think about what she just said. Had you been here in the tents, you have, you know, past, present, and future tense. She just used a past tense. Had you have been here, my brother would not have died. Had you been here, my brother would not have died. What did she just do? She just did what most people do when they're really in a crisis. And I know a lot of people are in crisis today who love Jesus. So get this message today. There's going to come a time when there is a crisis. And it could even be like this one, life and death. But we have a tendency when things don't go our way or when Jesus doesn't show up until the fourth day, we have a tendency to do exactly what Mary just did, which was to say, had you been here, my brother would not have died. She had faith. Listen, here it is. This is why we're here today. She had faith in Jesus, but only regarding her past with him. Hear me. 
Did you hear what she said? Had you been here? My brother, there's no doubt in her mind that had Jesus been there four days earlier, her brother Lazarus would still be among the living. So she had absolute faith that had Jesus been here, her brother would not have died. And that's right. But she only had faith in the past with Jesus. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? And a lot of times when we get into trouble and we get into despair, we fall back on the past. Lord, had I just done this or that and another, I wouldn't be in this problem that I'm in. I know you could have saved me. I know that you could have helped me. I knew that you could have been with me. I knew that you could have spoken to me in the night. I have absolute truth, but that was a long time ago. Too many of us have faith in Jesus from back then. And something that we remembered that Jesus stepped into our lives and, and healed us or helped us or spoke to us in the night. We fall back on our past. Doesn't work. Because we're supposed to live faith to faith. My appropriate action to what God has spoken to my appropriate action to what God has spoken. Faith to faith. She only had faith in the past of the power of the Christ. And she was very close to him. So if she can do it, so can I, and so can you. Watch how the conversation goes now. Martha said to Jesus, verse 21, let me go back up to verse 20. I know we've read it, but I'm going to do it again. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 22, even now I know that whatever you ask. Now here comes, she's not talking about faith now because of the wording. Watch this wording in verse 22. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Not me, not Martha, you. So she's still depending on a faith in Jesus from her past that right now in this crisis, <clears throat> she, can't see, she can't see a lot of faith in anybody right now. He's died. That, that's a period on the end of life. He's dead. And I have faith that you are the eternal one. I have faith that you preach the Sermon on the Mount. I have faith <clears throat> that you are the Son of God. I have faith that you are my substitute. I have faith that you are my high priest. I had faith that you were my high priest. And I still have those facts. I still have those facts. I still have that faith that the day I got saved or the day that I was really walking with you years ago, I really understood that you were with me. But now, just through the crisis called life, I'm just still depending on something that hasn't grown. I still, I believe it. I still believe it. But my situation is dead. It cannot be brought to life. I am dead. I, I'm, I've sinned too much. I've gone too far out of the way. I don't know what I'm doing. I know you saved me from my sin, but can you save me from my sin. I know you are the son of God, but does that mean anything in my life that you're the son of God? I know that you are the great healer, but does that, I, I know you were at one time, but I'm not so sure. And it's not that I don't believe you. It's not that I dislike you or hate you, God. I just lost my faith because of a crisis in my life. My brother died. Too many people, myself included, we, we sometimes look at the faith that we had 30, 20, 30 years ago and say, well, yeah, I still believe that with all of my heart, but I'm just too far over the line now. It's, it's gone too far. There's been a, a spiritual death within me. And if Jesus was to ask me, what are you doing here, John? I would say, I'm here because I have believed at one, and I still believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That you are the God incarnate, the incarnate, the you are the enfleshing of God into the flesh, the incarnation. And I believe that you died for my sins. And I believe every story in this book, I have believed that you are the Son of God. And I continue to believe that even in this situation, but I expect no help. That's really what we say when we don't have faith, our appropriate action to what God has spoken. But the next line is even more jarring to our spirits. Listen to what she says now. Verse 23, Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. Now, now, I mean, okay. What did she say back up in verse 21? Lord, have you had been here? She had faith in the past. 
And now watch what she says when Jesus says, your brother will rise again. Look at verse 24. Martha said to him, I know that he, what, are you seeing this? I know, this is Martha who said, Jesus, rise again, who already said, had you been here, now she makes this quantum leap up to the future. Martha said to Jesus, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Do you see what she, sure you do. It's not hard. She had absolute utter faith that she never lost. She didn't lose it. But she had absolute and utter faith in Jesus to save her and that his teachings were right, that he was God incarnate in the flesh. And now when pressed, what does she do? She jumps from her past to her future. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Had you been here, my brother would not have died. Still love you. Still believe that you're everything that you said you were. Hold nothing against you. But I absolutely know that had you shown yourself to me four days ago, my brother would have been healed. But death is taking it too far. And she, how does she respond? I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She just went from her past, which is good, to her future, which is good too, and missed the now of it all. Faith now. Not faith in the past. Not, uh, I can hear it now. I'll be, oh, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Yeah, 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 I get it. Swing low. We walk around. It's because, and, and then we say this, I'm just ready for Jesus to come back. See, see what we do it, we do it all the, all the time in our lives. The same Jesus that saved you can raise you from the dead and can raise your situation from the dead. You think there's no hope. You think there's no joy. You think there's no tomorrow. You think that there's no God working in your life. You think you've gone too far. You are spiritually dead. And all you can think back on is that I know that I'm a Christian. I know that I got saved and I got baptized. And, and I know that And everybody who has that problem would still confess and still could confess that Jesus is coming back soon. That's good. But I'm simply asking a question, what about today? How are you feeling about Jesus today? Watch what Jesus says to refute her argument. Now remember, Martha's the one that came out and said, had you been here, my brother would not have died. Let's keep reading the story because Jesus will answer it. He'll answer that kind of mentality of that past and future faith. Watch. Martha, verse 24, Martha said to Jesus, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Watch what he says. I am the resurrection and the life, Martha. You're looking in the past and you're looking in the future and I'm looking you in the eyes. Do you trust me? Do you trust me today when the situation is dead and over and darkness falls? Do you trust me? Trust me, Martha. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, watch the tense. Watch the tense of the word. Verse 27. So Martha said to him, yes, Lord, I say the next word have, past tense, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. And when she had said this, now this is incredible. Watch what happens now. Remember, Mary's still in the house. Martha's been the one who's having faith in the past, faith in the future, but having a hard time with the now. What about the sweet by and by? She's having a hard time with the nasty now and now. And most of us do. He even says, I am the way, I am the resurrection and the life. Now watch what happens. Verse 
20, let's read verse, oh, good, thank you. Let's read verse 27 again. She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the, I've believed it in the past, but I just can't believe it right now. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to Jesus. No, let me read verse 28. When she said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly to Mary, my, the teacher is calling you for you. And when she heard this, she got up quickly and was coming to Jesus. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village of Bethany, but was still in the place where Martha and Martha had met him. So the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, I just, I just... You read it. Where'd she get that? Say, Martha. She says, <laughs> word for word. I have, see, it's, it's kind of a, it, it kind of wears off on you. I want to hang around people that have faith now. Because their faith back then is going to wear off on me and I'm going to develop their own thinking and statements. Their own mindset, their own negativity. And you could look at that person and that person will say, I love Jesus. I got saved. I was a sinner. I went down. I fell. I got into a fetal position in the floor. The pastor anointed me and threw five gallons of diesel oil on me. To anoint my, I'm saying, what about, okay, that's great. That's a great testimony. But what about now? Yes, I also believe that. And yes, I also believe that Jesus is coming back. He's going to tear open the eastern sky and the trumpet's going to sound. Gabriel's going to come down and going to whoop, whoop us all. Great. What about now? What about now? Faith now, my appropriate action to what God has spoken. Let's see what the remedy is. It's coming. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw Jesus, verse 32, fell at his feet, saying to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Come and see the problem here. They still expected nothing. They just thought Jesus wanted to go see and visit the sepulcher, the tomb of, of his, one of his, be, if not his best friend, Lazarus. Where they laid him, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how Jesus loved Lazarus. But some of them said, here it comes. Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man, and that happened back in earlier, earlier chapters of John. John 9, have kept this man also from dying. So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and the stone was lying, and the stone was lying against it. And Jesus said to them, remove the stone. That's what he's going to say to us as we, as we are challenged in our minds, and I hope in our spirits today about this message. Yes, I'm, I'm not doubting your salvation. I'm not doubting that you love Jesus and still love him, even though you're going through a difficult time. You still love him. But you think it's too late to work because the situation's gotten too far out of hand. It's too, it's too dark. There's no reason to throw, it's like to throw an inner tube to the survivors of the Titanic. There's just not enough room. There's not enough space, not enough area to, to cover everything. That's what we really think when we don't have faith now. Believe me, guys, I'm preaching from experience. I know what it is to not have faith now. And it's awful. Because you feel like that you have disappointed God and Satan then comes on board and starts testifying that God is not who he says he was and that your crisis is proof that he doesn't love you anymore. Satan gets on board and causes that root of bitterness to come inside of us. Same root of bitterness is here. And what does he say to her, to them? Remove the stone. Remove that obstacle that puts itself between me, Jesus, and you in your darkness. Your the situation is dead. Remove that obstacle. Remove the stone. And when the Holy Spirit tells you to remove that, that doubt, remove that despair, remove that lack of confidence in Jesus, remove that stone. Watch what happens next. We'll, we'll challenge it. Verse... 39, Jesus said, remove the stone. We don't want to do it. Martha and the sister of the deceased said to Jesus, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, 
for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? There's what it's all about. He wants to, the reason he's waited this long is to, when you finally remove that stone, even though the situation behind it stinks to high heaven, once you remove that stone and once you see a resurrected life and joy filling back into your heart again, people are going to look at you and say, what happened? Why are you different? Watch what happens. So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out, and that's a very specific cry in Greek translation. It means loud, a, very, a holler, not, Lazarus, come on, come on out. No, he, he literally hollers, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus. Come forth. And as the old preacher, an old black preacher many years ago that I heard him say, had Jesus not called Lazarus by name, then the whole darn cemetery would come out. <laughs> Amen. Lazarus, very specific. That thing that's died now that the stone's been removed. I know girls, I know ladies that you've had, Martha and Mary, I know you've had faith in the past. I know that you'll have faith in the future. You've already confessed that. But even now, remove the stone and you'll see something that you have never seen before. And then Jesus says, loose him and let him go. Loose him. He came out all tied up. Loose him. Unbind him. I think the New American Standard says, God's version. Unbind him and let him go. Now, what was the purpose of all this? See, it's not, a, it's not just a purpose of us feeling better about ourselves. There is a purpose. I'm, I'm done. You give me five more minutes. We're gone. Watch this. I want you to turn, please. I'll show you the reason. Maybe you've never seen this before. Turn the page to John chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. Here's why. A living testimony. Watch. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that Jesus was there. Now they changed the... the Raising of Lazarus is known all over Galilee, Judea, Perea. They know it. Some of them hate it. Some of them love him for it. But you've got an opinion. He's a celebrity now. He's walking through the streets. Everybody's on board. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people following him now. Right or wrong, they want to see what he does next. They're curious. Verse 9 of chapter 12. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that Jesus was there. And they came. Not for Jesus' sake. Only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. <laughs> Heck with Jesus, we want to see the guy. Isn't that funny? The reason that God wants to do something with you with faith now is that you can be a testimony to when people want to come to you and say, we, we want to see what Jesus can really do in a person's life. We've never ever seen anything like this before. We, you become a living testimony that the stone has been, that you've had faith in the past and that you've had faith in the future, but that you've got faith right now. People want to know that. They want to talk to you. You used to do this. You used to be like this. You used to have such a negative attitude about things. You were in church every Sunday. You still believed in things of Jesus in the past. You still believed in the things of Jesus in the future. What happened to you? I removed the stone. I removed the stone and exposed the stench and the stinking body of death within that cave. And Jesus spoke into me new life. New life. As a matter of fact, it actually says it twice. This will be my last verse. I want you to turn, please, to John 12, not, not far, 17, 19. 17 through 19 and we'll be finished. It says the same thing. Watch this again. So the people who were with Jesus when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify about Jesus. For this reason also the people went and met Jesus because they heard that he had performed this sign. The Pharisees said to one another, you see what happens once you get it, people will want to see you. And then once they get it, other people will want to see them. That's what it just said. The multitude 
started being saved by hearing the stories of, they came to see Lazarus, Lazarus is alive, they went out and said, yeah, he's alive, all right, we watched it with our own eyes, and then people started coming to that group of people, and then it grows, and it grows, and it grows, and that's how the kingdom is, that's how the kingdom works. You are a living witness to the faith of Jesus in your life. I want you please just to bow your heads. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or anything like that. Sign a card. Nope. We don't do that here. But if there, it, I'm not doubting your Christian. I'm saying Martha loved Mary and Martha loved Jesus. Jesus loved Mary and Martha. But they still refuse to have faith now. All the faith was in the past or all the faith was in the future. What about now? So I want you, while you have your heads bowed, to identify if you're, if you're, and I think there's a lot of us that are. If you have some things you're thinking, I'm, I'm, the situation's too bad. I'm too lost. I'm in too much darkness. I haven't used faith now since I was seven years old, you might say to yourself. You know what Jesus says? If you have the faith to remove that obstacle, which will always be your ego or yourself, it'll always be yourself. If you have the faith, the appropriate action to remove the stone, I will raise the dead in you. I will raise the dead in you. And the, the consequences of that raising is that other people will come to see you. And once they see you, they will come to see others. Others will come to see you. It's all about being a living example. And Father, as we end our, our Sunday service today, may we be compelled to go back and read John chapter 11, one of the greatest stories of faith in all the scriptures. And may we remove the stone today, sometime in our bedroom or our kitchen or our living room or in our car while we're watching a sports game or just interrupt our day. We confess that we are Christians. We confess that we believe you. We confess that the Bible is infallible. We confess that everything in this book that is said about you, whether it's prophecy or the law or the Abrahamic covenant, is true. And that you, Jesus, are the Son of God, born of a virgin, born of a woman, born under the law who has come to redeem those of us who are under the law of sin and death. That when we're no, under, no longer under the law, we now have the ability to be sons and daughters of God. May we live and the membership of this church live in the now of faith. It is in the name of Jesus, the Messiah, Yeshua ben Nostri, the Christ, the son of the living God that I pray, amen. Thank you so much for coming today. Faith now, amen. Maranatha, let's all stand and read our final. See, if Mary and Martha can have some doubts, so can I, amen. If Mary and Martha can have doubts, anybody can. You ready to read this to the Lord? Let's let the angels hear us. I hope the angels go, uh-oh, church and peace is about to say something and they all do this. They're kind of loud. Let's say it like we mean it. Ready? You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Maranatha, everyone. I'll see you next Sunday.